I'm Matt Condolf, a member of the organizing committee for the California Colloquium on Water, and uh, I'll be introducing our speaker today, Jeff Mount. First, uh, Linda Vida, the director of the Water Resources Center Archives. Uh, the organization that puts on this lecture series has a few words. Thanks, Matt. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. <laughs> um, we do have some uh, colloquium brochures in the back if you wanted to pick one up. It has a beautiful picture on the cover, but also um, you can sign up to receive email announcement reminders before, uh, about a week before each lecture. What we used to do was pass around a sign-up sheet, but we're changing our system this semester. So if you are not now on our colloquium list, please sign up. Uh, on the sheet in the back, in the middle, back there, okay? And just a reminder that we do videotape each lecture and it's available uh, in streaming video on our website about two weeks after. Um, and uh, I think one more thing is we do have some new um, postcards and I believe, are they in the back? No, we'll put a few back there. Um, there are images from our collection and has our website and phone number on there. And uh, one more thing is that we are, um, you can become a member of the archives. We do have corporate or individual memberships and I think we have <laughs> some of those in the back. So thank you very much. Thanks. Well, I'm thrilled to see uh, all of you have come out today for the talk. Um, by the way, uh, do you realize it's Valentine's Day? <laughs> You're still here? Jeff, that's quite a compliment, I think. Um, <clears throat> Jeff will be uh, talking about the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, and I'd like to uh, make a, a little plug for other events we have going on on campus about the Delta. Jeff's talk is a good introduction to this problem, the problem that is being made worse by um, uh, urbanization. And you should be sitting not too far away from one of these blue forms, and we have plenty more. Um, it's announcing our symposium called Re-Envisioning the Delta, March 16th and 17th, in which we uh, try to tackle this issue of urbanization in the Delta. I mean, everyone knows it's a problem, but it's kind of out of the jurisdiction or above everyone's pay grade, and so it's hard for people to actually deal with this problem. But being academics with um, really no responsibilities, we, uh, you know, we, can, we can start talking about this. We also have um, a number of student projects that are related to this. Uh, each year in the Landscape Architecture Department, there is a um, competition, a design competition named after Tommy Church, who was a very influential modernist landscape architect. And uh, this year, the topic of that competition is the Delta, the once and future park. And uh, so interdisciplinary student teams will get together to come up with plans and designs looking ahead to 2050 when Northern California is built out. It's one big metropolitan area from San Francisco to Sacramento to Stockton to Livermore. And what will the Delta be? Will it be more housing, or could it be central park to this region? Uh, open space, infrastructure, and other functions. So this is the charge to the student teams, and uh, we're particularly interested in encouraging interdisciplinary student teams this year, uh, not just from landscape architecture, but uh, uh, have the teams include members from business, law, uh, natural resources, uh, sciences, et cetera. There's a uh, pretty good prize money this year, $5,000 for the first prize. I forgot what the second prize is, but anyway, there's, uh, even if you don't care about the Delta, you could uh, help pay for your college education with this. And um, there'll be a information section, session and mixer this Thursday afternoon, five o'clock, in room 315A Worcester Hall. So the info is all on here, and I urge, urge you all to come, and uh, it's a good place to meet people and form teams of like-minded folks. Now, 
Jeff Mount has been professor at UC Davis since 1980 in the Department of Geology. He received his BA from UC Santa Barbara in Geosciences, his PhD in Earth Sciences from University of California, Santa Cruz in 1980, and he and I overlapped at Santa Cruz. I was um, in the master's program when he was in the PhD program, and Jeff's wife, Jeff's wife Barbara was also a grad student at that time, and uh, she was my office mate. So Jeff and I have known each other very well over the years. And uh, it's a pleasure to have a good friend and colleague come and speak to us today. Jeff is a director of the Center for Watershed Sciences and Management at UC Davis, currently holds the Ray Schlemann Chair in Applied Geosciences and Presidential Chair in Undergraduate Education. He is a former member of the California State Reclamation Board, I'll come back to that. And uh, many of you know his book, California Rivers and Streams, The Conflict Between Fluvial Processes and Land Use. So the uh, California Reclamation Board, Jeff will explain more, I'm sure, but it has authority over flood issues in the Central Valley. And uh, Jeff was a member of the board, and in the past I'd say this board has been fairly sleepy, but uh, due largely to Jeff's presence on the board and some other very good people. And uh, Hurricane Katrina, you could say that the board became a lot more active in trying to assert the state's jurisdiction over flood-prone areas and dealing with the question of housing, which of course, land use is a local issue, and here the Reclamation Board was stepping in and saying, well, there's a state liability involved. Um, this uh, created some opposition, and uh, the opposition was able to get, have a, well, who knows what happened, but let's just say uh, on Jeff's birthday, he was fired by our esteemed governor. In fact, the whole reclamation board was fired. And uh, anyway, we've had better birthdays in the past, but, uh, but anyway, you're free now. You can speak your mind. So uh, it's with great pleasure that I give you Jeff Mount. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Now, this is the testing of the mic. Can you, all, can you all hear me? This is an unusual room for me to speak in. I feel like I should have eyeballs on the side of my head um, to watch you. But I assume this is where lawyers beat up on their professors. Um, I was terminated by the Terminator on my birthday, <laughs> which I consider to be a great career move, by the way. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the Reclamation Board today, but I am going to talk about something that I began with another uh, a, a faculty member for here at Berkeley who's now an emeritus, Bob Twist. He and I sat on the uh, Independent Science Board for CalFed. And lo, about a year and a half ago, he and I were tasked with the job of trying to look at the levee problem of the Delta and where it for, might, might or might not form a nexus for water supply issues and, and water supply reliability and water quality and ecosystem restoration in the Delta. And Bob and I got together and we wrote this report. <clears throat> I did some, some, some very simple modeling, which I'll show you today. Um, and we came back with a report and it made a lot of people really mad. Um, and be a good academic, I went back and closed the door on my office um, and then proceeded to start talking about this. And I've been amazed at the reaction. So I'm going to present to you today the results of that research. And then, and then and it isn't even really research. It was just some very simple stuff that we did uh, where I think we overstated the obvious. Um, but in the latter part of this, and I want to encourage you to interrupt me while I'm talking. Okay? Let's make it more like a classroom and less like a, less like a public lecture. I'm going to propose six alternatives for the Delta just to get the conversation started. It should, it should, or maybe it doesn't surprise you at all, we're not having that conversation. And we haven't had that conversation since we decided as a state to shut up about alternatives to the Delta and sign on to the CalFed record of decision in 2000. Or somehow that actually is the, was the ultimate limiter on free speech about the Delta. Okay, first of all, I do have a picture of Hurricane Katrina here. Uh, it is important to keep in mind how badly we can foul things up. Uh, when we have natural disasters. And I'm going to actually make, this, make a statement as an aside. This is the next Katrina right here. This is the Delta. Um, it is the other part of the equation that nobody wants to touch, except 
Matt Condoff <laughs> and Berkeley. Okay, first of all, um, I, I have, I've given, you can guess I've probably given a few of these talks, and I need to continuously remind people why you should care about the Delta. And you've got to laugh when, when Matt, when Matt said, said about that, but the fact is even here in the Bay Area, the number of people who really sort of say, what, uh, so what, so what about the Delta? Why should we care? First of all, I want to point out, it is such a, the Central Valley, that place that you are usually driving across on your way to Lake Tahoe, where you get your Jim Boy's tacos or something on the way. That's about, but most, most people's view of the Central Valley is a place to get across. That Central Valley basically collects more than 40% of the surface area of California, collects the runoff from it. It's a unique setting. And it is the hub of our water supply infrastructure. That's what, why that was in the title. 23 million people depend in part on water from the Delta uh, for drinking water. Most of the water from the Delta, and I want to make sure this is, this is clear to everybody, the vast majority of the water that is exported from the Delta goes to agricultural use, not to drinking urban supplies. Uh, 50% of the annual runoff, 40% of the surface area, more than 7.5 million acre feet of export per year, and proposals to actually increase that. And keep in mind, there's at least 1,800 in-delta diversions which feed the farm economy within the delta, and of course, 250 places that water is put back, and that the big deal is 1,100 miles of levees. But I want to tell you, this is a, this is a water supply in piece of our infrastructure which is at extraordinary risk. And I'm going to actually detail what the nature of that risk is. And, and by the way, you heard what my credentials are. My credentials are, I'm a geologist. And geologists, I got two of my former students from more than 20 years ago sitting here in the audience, we geologists view the world a little different than the rest of you. We tend to take a longer view. And I'm embarrassed when I tell my colleagues I'm looking at the 50-year view. Oh, what a sissy. You're supposed to be looking 1,000 years out, not 50. <laughs> But I am taking the 50-year view. I want to tell you, um, the State Board, State Water Resources C Control Board, is looking at setting new standards for the Delta. This is something that people are not paying much attention to. And these are some of the new standards they're going to set. It isn't all about salt in the Delta. There was a whole lot of other problems within the Delta and its water supply. And the Sword of Damocles, held by the Endangered Species Act, is dangled over the Delta constantly because it's Natural biodiversity, its biodiversity is through the roof, but of course now it's being made up mostly with invasive species, including a new invader a week in this system. But the big deal that nobody's talking about in the Delta, and they're just starting to talk about it, is when you read, pick up the Chronicle, and you read the Chronicle, and you discover that a man bit a dog on the front page of the Chronicle, embedded in, embedded in the back of the Chronicle, you'll find, when they talk about it, they talk about it as water supply. It's all about water supply, but it's not. It's much more than water supply. There is a series of environmental services that are provided by the Delta that people need to pay attention to because this is a very complex system. This is something that Matt's going to deal with. It isn't just water supply. It's also some of the richest agricultural land in the state and, of course, open space. It's critical for biodiversity. It is a flood control structure. All that runoff from the Central Valley ends up down in the Delta. It is also a waste disposal system. Every time you flush a toilet somewhere in the Central Valley, it ends up in the Delta. Every time you have runoff from a farm, it ends up in the Delta. It also has two, two ports within it, and a very large one in Stockton. It's got three major highways that go across it. There is a huge amount of fishing going on in the, in the, in the uh, Delta, and there's quite a constituency associated with it, a bunch of hunting, and just the industry of messing around in boats turns out to be a tremendous industry in terms of, in, in terms of its clout. And then the new environmental service, which is coming as we speak, and I'll talk a little more about this later, is urban development in the, in, the, in the Delta. Now, every one of these environmental services has a lawyer and a lobbyist and a constituency. And every one of these environmental services has a vested interest in keeping it the same. They want it to be the same. So everybody wants, wants to have the Delta deliver the same environmental services. That's the crux of the problem with the Delta. I hope by the end of today, you'll understand it's not going to happen, okay? That somebody's going to get voted off the island eventually in the Delta uh, because of the change. And that's what I'm going to lay out today. Okay, first and foremost, the thesis that I want to offer today is that the Delta is not a fixed landscape. It's a dramatically, rapidly changing landscape, which is undergoing change at multiple scales in both space and time. I'm also going to argue today that the nature of this change, which is inexorable and slow and not visible to you at any moment, can also change with what I'm going to call punctuated change, 
And, that is, and there's a very high probability that sometime in the next 50 years, the delta is going to rearrange itself. It's going to spectacularly rearrange itself, significantly disrupting these environmental services. And then here's the bad news at the bottom of the slide. And this was the point that kept coming out. Now, this is changing. Okay, This is an overstatement with, by design. But if you looked at the old state water plan, if you looked at CalFed's plans, if you looked at the plans for Contra Costa County, you looked at plans for everybody, they were all predicated on the notion that the delta is a fixed landscape and that it's going to hold still into the indefinite future. And it's just not. It's just not. It's changing rapidly. Now, as I say, people are starting to come around to realize that, um, that it is changing and it's some, producing some very goofy and interesting um, perturbations in government. Right now, most of the focus that you see is on levees. It's all about levees. Um, and, and, if, if, and in fact, you're hearing now, of course, lots of proposals to sink billions of dollars into levees in California. The problem is the levees are a, a symptom. They're not a cause. And just, that's, gonna be, that's one of the issues they have to worry about. Treating the levees is not going to take care of the problem. But it is the levees, the 1,100 miles of levees that people are focusing on in the delta that imperfectly hold back the water of the delta from the islands that surround it. And as most of you know, these are not islands per se. The big deal in the delta that, that people worry about, and it's back to the water supply, is the Big Gulp. And what happens during the Big Gulp is that when these islands fail, oh, I, did, I keep calling them islands. For those of you who aren't familiar with the delta, they're not islands. As Mark Reisner said, there are holes in the ground surrounded by levees, deeply subsided, in some cases 20, 25 feet below sea level. This is in a, what used to be historically a tidal freshwater marsh. They're 25 feet below sea level. So there are holes in the ground surrounded by massive, imperfect levees. And what happens when one of these breaks, as it did at Jones Track uh, a year and a half ago, when one of these fails, and of course the scariest one is Sherman Island right here, when one of these fails, Essentially, you have a difference in elevation between a water surface that's 20 feet above the interior of the island. And the power of that water as it is drawn into the island is immense. It will, it will carve holes in the ground 50, 60 feet deep at the place where it scours as it comes through. But the big deal there is it draws water out of San Francisco Bay. and draws water out of the bay and draws it into the delta. And we rely on the delta remaining a freshwater estuary. So it pollutes the delta. So that's the big gulp. The second thing that happens is when you flood areas like Sherman Island in the Western Delta, you change what's called the tidal prism. And this is essentially the wedge of, of brackish water, which is moving in and out of the, of the delta. And it changes the shape of the prism, prism such that it actually starts pumping salt into the delta. So it takes the delta, and, and you, you think, all right, we just flush it out, right? Well, it's really difficult to flush the water out once it's gotten saline. And once you have changed the circulation pattern, there's not much you can do about it, except perhaps rebuild the delta. And of course, when this happens, you are shutting down all of, all of the water supply out of the delta, at least particularly the western delta, um, which will have a major impact in Southern California and in Contra Costa County in particular. Um, and it has a potential to disrupt all the, surf the, the services from the delta, not just water supply. OK, so what I want to tell you is what's happening in the delta right now <clears throat> is those lands are continuing to subside. Sea level is rising. It's starting to accelerate in its rise. We've been hearing about this. It's true. I mean, this is one of those things that you can defend very well scientifically. Seismicity is a threat. You people in the Bay, you, you people, yeah, I'm one of you. It's OK. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, you foreigners who <laughs> live out here and talk funny. Uh, seismicity is something you deal with here in the Bay Area all the time. It is a major threat to the, to the delta. Sedimentation, the deposits of sediment in the channels. Climate change, more than just sea, sea level rise, we're seeing significant changes in the hydrology of, as water comes into the delta. We're seeing a major change in land use. And of course, as I say, we have an invader a week. A new, a new invasive species, on average, moves in every week to the delta. That is a system that is changing rapidly. In fact, I'll argue it's changing at a pace which exceeds um, there's a number of you here who are, are involved in a class. Here's a, here's a concept to, to think about. And the closer I look at the delta, the more I realize this, this is, I mean, if it's not true, it ought to be, OK? It's one of those things. It's, 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 a, it's a truism. The pace of change in the delta in terms of changes in the landscape, changes in the hydrology, changes in the ecosystem, changes in land use in the delta is happening so fast that we can't keep up with it, can't keep up with it either in policy or in science. On the science side, we're always looking backwards, and the, things, and the things we know to be true have changed out from underneath us so quickly, which has been part of the problem for CalFed. But they're throwing millions of dollars at it right now, and maybe that'll solve the problem. I don't think so. 
Okay, here's, here's, the, here's the roots of the problem. <clears throat> Historically, 700,000 acre area in the delta, tidal freshwater marsh, the richest ecosystem of the Western Americas. In, in terms of its overall per acre biological product, productivity, there was nothing could compare to this. And it was a tidal freshwater marsh, which would occasionally get brackish during, during years of drought. So it would have changes in salinity, uh, particularly in the western side. The big deal was, is this extraordinary biological productivity was basically bound up, was tied up in these tule marshes. And as, as these tule marshes would grow, these tremendous marshes would grow, and the tules would die, they would use up all the oxygen in the surrounding water. So it would go anaerobic. So there'd be very little decay. So over the last five to 6,000 years, you've accumulated a great thickness of peat in this system simply because it wasn't exposed to oxygen. So it was anaerobic conditions, making mostly methane and a little bit of CO2. Well, along come the Europeans uh, after the gold rush and basically reclaimed the delta. The term reclamation actually comes from a very old belief that the devil lived in these marshes. Not here, this is in Europe. This is European belief. And so you would get rid of the devil by draining these marshes. So the devil was extirpated from the delta. And we farmed it, and we began farming it. And the big change that occurred was we exposed the soils to oxygen. And once we exposed the soils to oxygen, the microbial communities that lived in those soils started breaking it down very, very rapidly. So that what was there originally as peat, organic carbon, 75% of it went off into the atmosphere as CO2, simply by the fact that they would drain these soils and expose them. Now, we made it worse with some wind erosion, um, so bad tillage practices. Um, there, was, there was practices for people who wanted to grow potatoes, particularly around World War II, where they just would light their land on fire. The peat will burn. Uh, it's so organic rich. So they would literally burn their island, lose four inches of elevation in one burn. Um, and there is compaction associated. With about, but about 75% of the loss of these islands causing this subsidence um, was basically due to oxidation. So now here we are today, and I'm sorry for those who can't see over here, but it's really not all that different than this, except that it's a whole lot deeper. So here we are today, we have massive levees. They're levees that are 30 feet higher than the interior of the island. They're levees that have not been constructed most of the levees have not been, in fact, the vast majority of the levees have been constructed privately. They've not been constructed as a single engineered levy. They're levees that were essentially accreted over time. So they're not engineered. They're very poorly made. In fact, we don't even know what's in the interior of many of these levees, except beavers. I'll get to that in a second. Beavers and ground squirrels. Um, and what you have is a situation of tremendous imbalance between this, the elevation of the sea level, which is what the water surfaces are tied to in the delta, and these deeply subsided interior islands. High pumping costs, tremendous levy, tremendous levy maintenance and repair costs. And then the bottom line is all of these levees are sitting on top of unengineered foundations. Okay, so these are a mixture of peat and fine sands highly unstable foundations, prone to failure during seismic events. And in fact, they constantly sag. There's a, there's a problem of compaction. OK, here comes the, I got to geek out for a little bit because I'm a scientist, OK? So you got to put up with that. Um, all right, so I sat down as a geologist and said, how do, you, how do you get a handle on this on a landscape scale rather than a local scale? We, you know, we can measure the depth of the islands. What does this mean? Well, it turns out I just came up with two basic indices or two basic measures that might capture what's going on over a very, very large area. The first is this notion, what I, what I call anthropogenic accommodation space. Accommodation space is something common in the geologic literature. It's just a big word for basically saying space that can accommodate either sediment or water. Okay, space that if, if you busted the levees loose would fill with either sediment or water. So that's accommodation space. And then the second thing was a regional hydrostatic force, a measure. When you think about it, if, a, if you have an island, you have a given island, and it's perfectly round. There's a, there is a hydrostatic force at any place on the island. If you add it all up, you get some cumulative hydrostatic force. It doesn't really work that way. But the difference between a perfectly round island and an island which has a very, very long levee is that island with a long levee has much more opportunity to fail. So its cumulative hydrostatic force is much greater, which is used as an indices, an index of potential failure. So the first is a consequence Meaning, the bigger the hole in the ground, when you fill it with water, the bigger the gulp that it takes out of San Francisco Bay. The bigger the hydrostatic force, which is a function really of the length of the levee and the difference between elevation between the top of the, the, the water and the interior of the island, 
the greater the likelihood of failure. So here it is just sort of drawn up for you. Um, anthropogenic accommodation space is that space which ought to be filled with sediment or water and is not. I mean, it's the part below sea level. Um, and then cumulative hydrostatic force, which is a function, for those of you in the sciences, is a function of the depth squared here. Okay, just keep that in mind. It'll, and so I went out and actually measured this stuff, did some basic simple si simulations, looked at the historical record of subsidence on a number of very well-surveyed islands, distribution of organic material, factored in future sea level rise, and then just simply modeled on a step-by-step -step basis how much the delta would continue to lower over the next 50 years if we assume business as usual. And business as usual in the delta is farming. Because if you're farming, you're subsiding, period. Okay? You, we have not come up with a technique even by using, even by using uh, rice, for example. Rice slows the rate of subsidence. But you still have to drain it, so it still will subside. Okay. And I did this, and what you get is, what you're looking at is burning up the last 5,000 years of peat that was deposited in the, in the delta. Because the sea level's been rising very, very slowly over the last 5,000 years, and the land has been subsiding very slowly. That is, the, 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 the crust underneath has been subsiding, and you're accumulating this thickness of peat. So a simple simulation. And so here it is, the wonders of GIS, where you can do this, of course, on this kind of a scale. Here is today. Okay, this is the delta today. By the way, this, the scariest thing when I did this was to discover that we have no idea what the elevations are in the delta. Our, our most up-to-date elevations were from 1986. And if you look, at, the, if you look at, at subsidence rates on the order of one, two, and as many as three centimeters per year, things might have changed since 86. Um, so we used the, the, the SRTM data, which was the space shuttle uh, data from 2000, and created this map. And actually, Ground Truth did, and it came out, came out I, actually, I was really impressed. Um, these dark areas here are areas that are 15 feet or, or more below sea level. Okay? And here it is 50 years from now. And 50 years from now, the central and western delta, all of it is substantially below 15 feet, and some of it is as much as 30 feet below sea level. So quite substantial subsidence over the next 50 years. You'll notice not much change in the south delta. That's because they've already burned up all the peat. Peat's gone. So it's not subsiding quite as much. But this factors in sea level rise. And here's some data just to show you, what, uh, our, and, and some simulations, basically. And the interesting thing about this, by the way, I've, I've, you can see I've colored the delta on the left side, is the central and western delta, the areas which have the greatest effect on, our, on water supply reliability out of the delta, not only have undergone, created a tremendous amount of accommodation space, but they're not going to stop. And they're going to keep going for the next 50 years, and that space is going to continue to expand. What's interesting is the south delta and the north delta, um, the south delta has burned up most of its peat, so it's not going to expand by much. And the north delta still has tremendously thick piles of peat. But because it was close to the Sacramento River, the peat has a much higher inorganic content, so its rate of subsidence is much lower. And the east delta is done. In fact, it's being paved over by Stockton as we, as we speak. But I'll get to that. All right, so ge geologists have a tendency, well, we have a tendency to tell stories, uh, and great stories, and the things that happened hundreds of millions of years ago. <clears throat> and we can't put things into scale. So I've tried here to put things into scale for you. All of you are familiar with the hydraulic mining era uh, as being perhaps the most environmentally destructive period in the history of California, if you measure it as a function of the profit derived from that destruction. It was nothing. It was about four years of, of present oil production was equal to all the gold that was taken out during the hydraulic mining era. And yet it absolutely transformed the San Francisco Bay, transformed parts of the Delta, and certainly transformed the Sacramento Valley. It would take two and a half of those areas, eras to refill the hole created by the loss of soil in the Delta. That's a lot of sediment I got to give you. And of course, to give you, it's, it's about equal to the volume of material used to construct Rome. It's, that's what's lost. And those of you who have been to Rome know it's a pretty big city. So I commonly hear people say, well, why can't we capture all the sediment that's coming into the delta and put it back in the islands? Which would magically jump out of the channel and go into the islands. Well, you know, they're doing that in parts of the Mississippi. They're actually hosing the sediment into the, into the adjacent marshes. It's very expensive to do. But even if you could do it, it takes 1,500 years to restore the elevations in the delta with the current rate of sediment coming into the delta. Um, but even that doesn't keep up with the rate of sea level rise. 
and I can get into a, a nice circular argument about what happened over the last 5,000 years. The reason, and the, the sediment coming into the delta is about what it was historically, prior to the arrival of Europeans. That rate is, a, is approximately the same. But it's only about half, will only fill up about half the yearly increment of new accommodation space created. The other half was made up by organic production. So maybe you could do it if you could throw all that sediment into the, into the islands and produce tremendous wetlands and start growing organic material again in 750 years. Things might change in 750 years. Okay, give you an idea of this, every day the delta takes a breath. In goes oxygen and out goes CO2, it's a greenhouse gas. And every day, 27,000 cubic meters, which is about a quarter million dollars worth of soil, goes into the atmosphere. This is give you a sense of the scale. And then I basically calculated the total carbon emission is roughly equal, of, that has happened over the last 100 years, is roughly equal to six years of California's total carbon emissions today, at the rate we're emitting carbon today. And about 12% over the last 100 years. So if this was a smokestack, you'd regulate it. Okay, well that's the accommodation space problem. On the right hand side of the last slide. Oh yeah. Well, you know, that was to remind you about hydraulic mining. This is the Yuba Gold Fields, uh, and an area that which received a lot of the hydraulic mining sediment, and they're remining the sediment itself. Um, okay, cumulative hydrostatic force. Um, I just want to remind you, these 1,100 miles of levees do an imperfect job of holding back the water. And this striking feature about cumulative hydrostatic force is although accommodation space increases and slows, remember this force is a function of the depth squared. So in fact, the cumulative hydrostatic force is continuing to grow very rapidly. And even though subsidence is slowing, it's slowing, but you're forming, still forming a tremendous amount of hydrostatic force. So the point is, is this is driving instability of the levees overall. So, Gradual landscape change. This is the thing I'm going to be coming at. Tendencies and I'm all talking about tendencies and trajectories here. I'm not talking about specifically saying this island is going to fail on 2013. I'm only talking about tendencies, okay? But you are continuing to make accommodation space. So the big gulp is getting bigger and bigger. You're seeing a significant increase in hydrostatic forces. So you're seeing an increasing tendency for island flooding in the delta with unknown impacts. And here's the bad news. We stopped putting money into the Delta a long time ago. And we have a current backlog on the order of about two, one to two billion dollars. I think when we take a hard look at it in the next year, it'll be about two billion dollars. This is basically to set to a basic federal standard for the exterior of the levees. It doesn't address the interior of the levees and doesn't address the foundations. It's a basic federal standard that was set back in 1986 after the, after the Delta had a significant flooding event. That doesn't do anything for the other problem I'm about to illustrate here, but all that does is just set a standard for the height of the levees and the width of the levees and the exterior of the levees. And this is back for 1986 conditions. Things have changed substantially since 1986 in 20 years time. Okay, there's my former employer here. Uh, <laughs> 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 Check out the guns on that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> no, that's even the hat right there. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, um, okay, so how are we doing? We had a little wake up, uh, I, that's an overused phrase. Okay, we had a little freak out uh, a year and a half ago uh, on a sunny day in June on Jones Track in the Delta, which really illustrated the nature of this problem. The Jones Track failure and the, occurred uh, uh, in <gasps> early June during a high tide, sunny day, no, no earthquake, nothing. The levee went, and it failed in a spot that had been inspected by a certified engineer 24 hours before it failed. It really was not good to be that engineer. Uh, <laughs> and he's actually a very talented, highly qualified engineer, by the way. That illustrates part of the problem. The other part of the problem is the evidence for what caused the failure washes away with the failure. <laughs> but I can tell you that the number of beaver hats on the farmers in the Delta after this were amazing. Probably was a beaver that did it, did it in. There's beavers all over the Delta now. So let me give you, the, this was the Jones Track failure. It was a good, it was a good island failure. Um, now, what I mean by a good island failure, first the governor showed up right away, got off his helicopter and said, fantastic, we'll fix everything. Uh, <laughs> and then he got handed the bill. Uh, it broke through, 
But actually, I tell you, everything about the delta is the law of unintended consequences. It just dominates everything. OK, so this thing failed, and it filled 11,000 acre island. I'll give you the statistics here in a second. But I wanted to tell you what happened. Is one of the things that happens when these islands fail, they'll fill. This is 11,000 acres. So you can imagine the wave fetch on this is huge. And anybody who knows the delta knows it blows like heck in the delta. And so these waves sweep across these islands and then just tear the levees apart from the inside out. Well, this was a perfect levee failure. It failed in one spot, and it was an area with a road, so you could come out of Stockton and bring trucks and prison crews, which is what they do it with, and prison crews to fight the flood from the, on the inside of the levee. And basically to line the levee, miles and miles of levees with visqueen, and to get out there and fight the flood. Well, sure enough, what happens, of course, they haven't upgraded any of the topography in the delta. This little levee here came under attack. And this is, separates Trapper Slough. And on the other side of this is Roberts Island. And those of you who know the delta know that had that levee failed, and they said they came within 20 minutes of losing that levee. Because what happened, the levee had sagged. Okay, and so they, you got attacked by the waves, started to tear it apart. The good news is they got all the trucks. They went over to Stockton, got a whole bunch of soil, and put it on the levee and saved it within 20 minutes. But that soil that they went to get in Stockton, which was so conveniently piled up, was a waste dump. And so it was polluted. <laughs> and so they grabbed soil that had lots of contaminants in it and built this levee. And now they're in, in the millions of dollars to try and figure out what the hell to do with it. Um, so they've agreed to monitor it uh, uh, for a while. <laughs> had they lost it, it had gone through Trapper Slough and into Roberts Island. Next stop was Stockton. Um, that didn't make it in the news, by the way, for some reason. DWR didn't want to talk about it. OK, June 3rd, 11,000 acre island, subsided 10 to 12 feet below sea level. They, and they, when they pumped it out, they kept having to pump it. And they just said, why is it taking so long to pump this island? Well, that's because the elevation they used was from 1986. And it had subsided an additional 20 years before it failed. And that's why it took so long. The volume had increased so much, which added a lot of expense. But it was a single breach. Keep this in mind. That single breach was so convenient because you could drive trucks around the island and fight this thing with crews. It cost $44 million to repair the levee, about one and a half times the land value. Total, total cost was $100 million. Total cost in the region and everything else was $100 million cost. That's one island. And we did shut down the pumps. Uh, in the process. But wait, I'm not done giving you the bad news. We had a little flood this year. It was a 10-year event. Okay, You should see plenty of those in your lifetime. It was a 10-year event when it came into the Delta. And there were more than 20 major levee fights in the Delta from this little event in January. And they nearly lost Twitchell Island. And actually, they nearly lost a couple more islands. It was a heroic effort to save those islands. Appropriately enough, Twitchell Island is owned by the state. Uh, and and they should be taking care of it. Actually, they said more interesting is that a bunch of islands are owned by the state. Um, most of Sherman is owned by the, by the state. Twitchell is owned by the state. And there's other islands are partially owned by the state. And the state farms them, which of course means they're adding to the subsidence while they farm these things. Go figure. All right, so I've been talking about this gradual change. And what I'm trying to get, give this impression over the next 50 years is this increasing likelihood of more and more Jones Track style failures. So an island will fail here. We'll sink $100 million into fixing it. An island will fail here. We'll sink $200 million into fixing it. Because we've got to keep this levee net network together because it's so essential for our water supply. But in fact, there's the other side of this, and that you can have abrupt change. And abrupt change would involve, of course, an earthquake or a flood, either one, earthquake or a flood. Keep that in mind. Punctuated landscape change, as I'm describing it, is basically a significant rearrangement, probably five or more islands failing. And the reason I use that, that number as punctuated change is I'm going to tell you, we can't fight a levee fight. We can't fight the fight once we lose that many islands. We haven't the infrastructure capacity to basically repair those levees within a reasonable amount of time. So the seismic event in the Bay Area, which will drive you crazy, um, which might occur on Hayward Calaveras Fault, might occur on the Central Valley Fault. One of these fault zones there on the Western Delta produces ground accelerations sufficient to liquefy the levees, and, and in some cases, and to cause them to compact and sag. So a roughly 100 year, year interval, recurrence interval earthquake, 5 to 20 levee segments would fail. And I'm going to give you a scarier uh, version here in a second. 
Okay, so they fail due to these due to substandard foundations. Also, I want to remind you, the entire delta is mapped into the National Flood Insurance Program 100-year flood plain. That is meaning a true 100-year event, which we have not seen in the delta. Okay, 86 was not a 100-year event. 97 was not a 100-year event. They were far below that. The 100-year recurrence interval produces multiple flooded islands within the delta. Both of these processes can cause a substantial rearrangement. And here's some stupid, stupid statistics. Okay, and I go, what's the probability that a 100-year earthquake is going to occur over that simulation period? It's 0 0.40, 2 in 5 probability. What's the probability that a 100-year flood event would occur? 2 in 5. What's the probability that both? Okay, 16%. Doesn't sound like much. It's the same odds as rolling a 7, for those of you who like to play craps. And you know you bet on a 7. Okay, what's the probability that either of these are likely to occur in the next 50 years? All right, it's a 2 in 3 probability. That sounds to me like a reasonable probability to make some planning adjustments to. But as I've said before, most of it has been predicated on the notion that all oh, this is going to be fine. Um, and we're going to take care of it. And when I say we can't respond to these kinds of floods, I mean it. This is Dutra Corporation. It is the last contractor left in the Delta. Now, they're doing fine. They've recently emerged from bankruptcy. Um, and <laughs> they've got all the cranes and the barges, but they can only fix two or three levee breaks in a season. If you had 20 levee breaks, you can't fix them. So you're going to have to let some of these islands go. And as I said before, once one of these islands go, it attacks the adjacent island. So you have a domino effect in the delta. And here it is. For a year, I was considered the ghoul of the delta. Because uh, I was going around and going, boo, <laughs> telling everybody the Delta was going to fail, and your life was going to be miserable, and you're all going to die. Um, but I have been upstaged by the director of the Department of Water Resources, Lester Snow. Lester Snow says his, his, his scenario is 16 islands failing with a 6.5 quake on the Hayward Calaveras Fault. Shut down of all the water projects. Loss of two major highways, railroad, gas, and oil pipelines, the end of two ports, the closing of two ports. Could you just point out where the pumping plants are? Okay, they're here. The biggest, the big, the state, state water project and the Central Valley project basically take water out of here, most of it. And then the Contra Costa Canal is farther up. So 85,000 acres farmland loss and only 3,000 homes. That's an underestimate of what it's going to be. Permanent loss of a number of islands in here. Um, and increased dependence on low quality San Joaquin water. Um, and the five year costs, and they admit this is way low as an estimate, is $40 billion. Okay? So that's a low estimate. The estimates I have seen are closer to $100 billion, the early estimates, where you're, where you're actually going and projecting what this might actually cost. Now, $100 billion sounds like a lot of money. That's what we're going to spend to put New Orleans back together. OK, that's a substantial amount of money. Once you have lost this many, it's very hard to fix it. The proposals that are coming forward from DWR and what to do about it literally involve rocking off the delta and then taking San Joaquin water and basically routing San Joaquin water to the pumps to restore it. Those of you who know San Joaquin water know that you don't want to drink it. Um, it has passed through the bowels of thousands of cattle and run off, run off the uh, farms. This is, it, this is really some of the worst water quality in the state comes out of the San Joaquin River, except for the new river, I suppose, Southern California. That's a problem. And you can bet somebody's going to start digging a peripheral canal when that, come, when that happens. OK, I'm going to get to that, by the way. OK, so that's, that's the sort of the bad news. Let me sum it up, and then we can get into a nice talk about this. First of all, my conclusions based on this, these simulations is we're really looking at more Jones tracks, significant increase in Jones tracks. And at $100 million a pop to put them together, you have to start asking whether or not to save an island. Good news, DWR has announced that as a policy. It kind of came out real quiet. DWR has said they will participate in the flood fight, but at the end of the flood fight, they will evaluate whether there's a compelling state interest to fix that island and to pump it out. Translation meaning for a water supply issue. Okay, Significant potential for, for what I would call punctuated change, reorganization of the del delta with far-reaching effects, and current planning remains predicated on this fixed landscape, although that is changing as we speak. So that said, what I would like to do is do six options. Now, I gave a talk a month or so ago to this, to a, to a, the, the uh, what do I want to call this? A peaceful meeting of the warring parties. 
And this was the Southern California Water Contractors. That group met with the Bay Area Council. Okay, now these are, these are two organizations which were at war in the past over that sucking sound, which was Southern California taking all of Northern California's water. And they had a very interesting meeting, which involved, of course, rubber chicken for lunch. <laughs> I was really sick of rubber chicken. So this meeting, they were all saying, we need to start coming up with a solution. So I rolled out just these six, and I'm going to talk about now. And it is, it's, I find it astonishing that even that group had not sat down and said, what, are, what is the array of options? That's what's going on now in DWR with the, the Delta Risk Management Study. And a number of studies that are going on right now are taking a look at it. I'm very hopeful that Matt's, um, Matt's project, which will look at the urbanization issue in the Delta, will explore some of these options. So let me go through some of these options. And please, interrupt me as I go and make me clarify what the hell I'm talking about. Oh, you were thinking Bauhaus when I had Bau Delta, but okay, business as usual Delta. And that means pursuing the current policies in the Delta into the indefinite future. Um, and of course, what that simply means is we live with and invest in fixing the islands. We live with increasing instability for all those environmental services. They occur at greater and greater risk. And we have to acknowledge that in time, I mean, I've just factored in a one foot rise in sea level. By, 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 the year, by, by, the next, by the end of the next century, we're looking at somewhere between two feet, and some people now are projecting as much as three foot rise in sea level. That's a wipeout for the delta. Miss the end of the delta. Uh, because you, can't, you, can't, you just can't keep up with that kind of sea level rise. So we have to acknowledge that we will be dealing with planning by crisis. And we're good at that in California. Okay? So that's the business as usual delta. The second is what I call fortress delta. There is a strong political pressure to invest in the levees. Diane Feinstein says, fix those levees. Richard Pombo says, fix those levees. Um, the, the legislature now is saying, fix those levees. Well, there's one consequence of fixing those levees that has to be thought through. To fix those levees so they're bulletproof means you are going to make houses. Because as soon as you reduce flood risk in the, in the delta, you're going to have development. Those houses right there are below sea level. Okay, and this is on the edge of Stockton. Stockton is proposing 40,000 new homes in the Delta. There's a total of 130,000 new homes being proposed for the Delta all around the rim. And the way they're paying for it, their flood protection, is if you've got real estate in California, it's money. It's big money, and you can afford to put up what the local developers call super levies, which sound a lot to me like super tanker when I hear it. Um, super levies. Um, and including my favorite project, now that I'm not on the reclamation board and can talk about these things freely, uh, is the River Islands development on Stewart Track and the South Delta, which I think is dumb growth. There's just no other way to put it. This is, this is putting an island right in the hub of water supply infrastructure and virtually eliminating any flexibility in the future. That's the consequence of Fortress Delta, is that you will promote urbanization. Every little city that's in the Delta now wants to grow. Bethel Island wants to grow with its goofy three-story high houses up on stilts. Um, the pressures for urbanization are immense. And I'm telling you that I think this is actually going to be one of, the, one of the futures of the Delta. The problem is, how do you deal with the seismicity issue? I don't know. Um, but in any case, money talks in this system. And money can, and a lot can be derived from urbanization. The second is the isolated facility. Um, used to be known as a peripheral canal. Um, by the way, there was a, those of you who are familiar with CalFed, which was this, which is sort of fallen apart and is being rebuilt um, as this joint federal and state organization, um, part of the sort of shut up about alternatives came out of CalFed. The CalFed's premise was we're all going to get better together. Stacy's going to correct me. This is a Okay, you want me to explain what I mean? We should be talking about when we talk about this is let's call it the Sacramento River Water Diversion Facility. Okay, Stacy would like me to call it the Sacramento River Water Diversion Facility. <laughs> is there a good acronym in there somewhere? Truth and advertising. Truth and advertising. Okay, we're talking about taking water out of the Sacramento River at Hood right up there at the top there, running it around the delta so we don't have to run it through the delta, and taking it to the pumps in the south. Okay? That was the old peripheral canal, which was defeated in 1982. Um, and it's back. 
it's back on the table as an option be because people are realizing that you just can't sustain the delta uh, very well uh, into the long-term future. So it's back, and we're talking about it. Of course, as currently discussed, it doesn't do a damn thing for all the other issues in the delta, uh, all the other environmental services of the delta, but it does take care of one of the big environmental services in the delta. You had a question? So the peripheral, well. The okay, the whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Stacy's Canal, okay. That would ensure, that would be, uh, ensure water supply. Yes, absolutely. Look, all the, all the clean water, all the abundant water comes into the delta from the north. All the export is from the south. Not, almost all the export is from the south. Yeah, virtually all the export is from the south. This is a system which was never designed to do what we're asking it to do. I mean, it was, I mean, this, this, I mean what were they thinking is what, when I look at it as a design. Sort of. The, the political reality, this was, viewed, this was viewed as a water grab from Southern California, yeah. principally driven by Metropolitan Water District from Southern California, and that's the way people in the Bay Area viewed it when they voted virtually unanimously against it. That's going to come up in the next one. Yeah. So, uh, and we actually got a fair number of buff water buffaloes here. Yeah. <laughs> point when we talk about Southern California, I just want to remind people that about 4 million people yeah. in the Bay Area get water from that right. South Bay pumping plant. Right. Which is why it's, it's which, you know, when I said 23 million Southern people. California starts in Solano County. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so um, here's Southern California here. <laughs> this is Northern California here. Um, this is, of course, the hot button issue. I, I don't think I'm surprising any of you by any any of you by saying this is going to be this is back on the table. This is going to be a hot political issue. Um, there are going to be many ways to slice and dice it, uh, but the fact is the Bay Area is entire is four, four million people in the Bay Area are dependent on this system. It is not just the tropical splendor of Southern California and their swimming pools and their lawns and their movie stars. Um, it's actually four million people in the Bay Area. But I want to also remind you, most of the water, when you're thinking about this, goes to agriculture, the San Joaquin Valley, including a number of low-value crops in, in, the, in the San Joaquin Valley. In any case, the peripheral canal does not take care of all these other things. It's going to take, have to take some other things to, 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 I mean, other approaches are going to have to deal with the, with the delta, uh, other environmental services. Okay, the other is opportunistic delta. People have been talking about this for some time and actually doing stuff about it. And that is to, to give some thought to the fact that you're going to have episodic disruptions in water supply in the delta. Um, and this involves reuse recycling. Look, south of the Tehachapi's, only 25% of the water comes from the delta. You know, the rest of it they get on their own internally and from the Colorado River. So there's the possibility that Southern California, south of the Tehachapi's, in an opportunistic strategy like this, where you're creating increased storage to the south, whether it's conjunctive use in groundwater, may well be able to live without regular pumping from the delta. It's agriculture in the San Joaquin Valley, which is at the greatest risk. But look at pumping during the winter when it's flowing like crazy may well be a future strategy when it's very fresh during large runoff events. Okay, abandoned delta. Uh, this is, this is Stacy can chime in on this. Um, but remember, we're, what I'm talking about, these are options which you would have picked. I, I, no one ever imagines any of these would be the way it happens. It, so you take, take pieces of it. But if you listen to people like Stacy and other biologists, they're telling us that one of the big problems in the delta, of course, is invasive species. And because we have converted the delta into this perennially fresh water system. And so you have things like Egeria have moved in. And variety, well, of course, you've got two different types of clam bracketing on either end, which are stripping all the productivity out of the delta. One model is to allow the delta to get salty again and allow these islands to fail 
and let salt water come into the delta periodically, which would significantly knock back the invasive species, like Egeria, for example, which is this weed that grows throughout the delta, the freshwater portions of the delta. And you might actually start restoring that. The problem is most of those islands are so deeply subsided that you can't make the very habitat that was there originally, which was shallow, subtitle, shallow subtitle to intertidal freshwater marsh. Okay, and that's gone from the delta. And here's one of the biggest challenges for people trying to do ecosystem restoration, is this entire area was tidal freshwater marsh, and it's gone. And in fact, it can't be brought back because these are so deeply subsided without the investments of billions of dollars to try and restore elevations. There's all kinds of wild ass ideas out there. I gotta tell you, it's great. For example, one proposal floating around in DWR was to take the Montezuma Hills and to mine the Montezuma Hills and dump them into the delta to restore elevations. A little back of the envelope calculation, no problem, $10 billion. Piece of cake. No environmental consequences either. <laughs> Actually, the big idea was to, to, to was, you, it was the Bay Area. It was to dig a hole in the ground, put it here, and you would pay for it because you'll dump your garbage there. So there would just be a series of landfills in which we would transfer space over into the Delta. These are the kinds of fantastic ideas that are going around. But the point is you're going to have to find shallow subtitle, sh shallowly subsided portions of the Delta in order to restore habitat, a key habitat. And that exists here. That's here. All in this part and the northern Delta. And here, this band right here is basically, I will tell you, I'm doing a little project on the side. The developers are optioning the land at values which are amazing. I mean, off, I mean this is land that is worth two to $3,000 an acre at, on, a, on a good day, okay? And they're optioning it at 10 times that. So the options they're snapping up all over this place is they're figuring it's all going urban at some point. So your, choice, your potential for ecosystem restoration is these shallowly subsided lands, and that's under great threat. This might be the optimal ecological alternative. Oh, of course, that alternative is you've got to live without water supply from the delta. Um, there, therein lies one of the problems. The last idea is the notion of a refilled delta. Um, nobody's asked about the notion of just filling these islands and using them for water supply. Okay, so this is, a, this is an idea that's been around for a long time. It's got some major issues associated with dissolved organic carbon and the cost of treating it, plus methylation of mercury. But an alternative might be, since we pumped 2.3 billion cubic meters of peat into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, is to actually start thinking about the delta as a carbon sequestration site. Suppose, as the, since we would rank as the G7 economy, if we were in the G8, we'd be G7. That's what California would be. Suppose we decided we wanted to hold our emissions, our CO2 emissions, constant. Suppose that Governor Jerry Brown uh, <laughs> comes back and he's reelected governor again. Says we're going to we're going to grow in California, but we're going to we're going to sign the Kyoto Accord and we're going to go on our own because when we do it here, other states do it. By the way, I mean, you've noticed that. Um, we're going to go ahead and hold our CO2 constant. Our emissions constant. You could do it, back of the envelope calculation, you could do it by paying the farmers to farm carbon in the delta and finding a way to actually bury it and keep it anoxic. And that's a whole lot different than growing forests on hillsides because forests on hillsides eventually recycle that carbon. In this place, if you can bury it underwater in the delta in an anoxic environment, it's gone. It's gone for thousands of years. So here's a wild ass master's thesis right there to go ahead and do that. Yeah. yeah. Have they not considered the alternate effects of methane production too, though? Yep, and that's because probably one of the problems with these, with going ahead and going ahead and making these anoxic settings. I mean, this is you know the proposal. One of the reasons we got green greenhouse gases going is methane production due to rice, I mean, literally rice fields. Tremendous well, methane production. Also into Central yep. Valley, also. Yeah, and so that would be a problem. And of course, if you did start doing this, you do have to pump these islands out occasionally. So lots of dissolved organic carbon drives people in Contra Costa crazy because of the treatment costs. In any case, these are all, the point is, all of these involve significant trade-offs. So I list these three to kind of sort of stimulate conversation about alternative futures. But I can tell you the one future I'm absolutely certain about, and Matt's conference is going to deal with this, and it might be very entertaining, is that urbanization is, going to, is, is, is the next phase in the delta. And the problem with urbanization, all of these other options I've given you are undoable. I mean, once you've done them, you can undo them. If you flood an island, well, you don't think that's a good idea. You rebuild the levees and drain the island. I mean, it, it's all undoable. It's not undoable once you urbanize it. There's, there is, that is truly a regret strategy. 
and you will never be able to get them out of there. And moreover, once you put homes in that delta, you are now operating the delta for the people who live in homes because public safety trumps all the rest of this. So that's one of the options. But the cynical side of me <laughs> tells me that this is going to be very, very expensive. Nothing is going to be cheap. Even abandoning the delta is going to be expensive. It's just nothing is going to be cheap. And that's where I think we run into the problem. And now many of you have already watched what's going on in the legislature and how proposals to try and pay for these things continuously get ground up. Proposals to try and restrict development shut down immediately. And actually, it's very interesting. They're, they're labeled dream killer bills because it's killing the American dream. The building industry will label, if, it's, if you've got the stamp dream killer on your bill, it's done. It doesn't make it through the legislature. We'll make it through the governor or the legislature. So I, we are, we're, at, we're at an very interesting time. And I think the politics of this for the next year will be very entertaining to watch if you like watching politics. Um, John Stewart will probably cover it. That's my hope. <laughs> That's the only place I get any news, by the way. <laughs> Not the Chronicle. All right, so with that, um, now if I've completely depressed you, uh, I thought what I'd do is sort of open it for comments and or questions. Thank you very much. I have a simple question and a technical one. No, I... To calculate the subsidence mm -hmm. of the peaks, you do need to know that Yes. What is the thickness? It's extremely variable throughout the delta. The good news, DWR has uh, a, an absolute mesh of boreholes through the delta, and they measure the thickness of the peat, and they've got that in a GIS layer if you want to get at it. It's wrong, okay, because it's old. It's 20 years old. So you have to make some, some basic estimations of how much peat was lost in the last 20 years in that system, but all the data is about 20 years old. It seems to me logical we should know that, but we don't. Stacy. You stand on your soapbox and tell us that the uh, emperor is hard um, I'm, I'm just wondering, is, is anybody listening? Yes. And is there uh, more of the soapbox? Yeah. OK, I got to tell you, um, a year and a half ago, when Bob Twist and I were first talking about this, we were, we were labeled nuts. We were, or, uh, uh, I was described as a charismatic shit stirrer. I think that was a good description. I mean, we were just making trouble. Everything's changed. Now, the head of DWR, there's Lester Snow, is telling a scarier story than I am. Um, he's going around going boo all over California. So in fact, leadership at that level, okay, at that level has emerged. And DWR is, I think, taking a lot of, taking a, I mean, they're being real bold about it. Um, it has not percolated up any higher than that. Yeah, because the implications of all this stuff is, is you just described a massive problem that is only parts of the problem that we're going to anticipate in the next 15, 20 years in, in, in the short span. And, and uh, in, in order to solve these, these problems, from, from where I'm listening, there aren't a lot of people that are building visions. Here's a vision. Here's where we have to go. Here's uh, objectives to achieve. You know, we just sort of bring our hands and say, well, Okay, so the, the, the people who have the most at stake are the water contractors. At least they, that's what they think. Um, and the water contractors have proposed a solution. Because we are incapable, we're politically incapable of making really tough decisions. And at the roots of what I was talking about is the fact that you have all these environmental services, and all these services have a lawyer, and they all have a lobbyist, and they all have a constituency. So you can't say you are being voted off the island. So their proposal, this is Aqua's proposal, is a base closure commission, the equivalent of a base closure. Because you know they discovered ages ago Congress couldn't decide what bases to close. They, they just haven't got the, the courage to do that. You get voted out of office. That's your reward for being courageous. So they want to do, a, they want to do the equivalent of, of a base closure, a blue ribbon panel. And that, that apparently is moving forward. Now, that requires that the legislature agrees to go along with what that blue ribbon panel suggests about what to do about this. Uh, you haven't seen that commitment on the part of the legislature yet. But um, that's the only proposal. I mean, what governor wants to die a, a horrible political death in response to tackling this unpleasantness in the Delta? I just, that, that's going to be, I think, the biggest challenge. Is political leadership is, is going to take a lot. 
How is the climate in the Central Valley and the Sierra likely to change when the, when the San Francisco Bay extends to the foothills? Well, technically it does, sort of. I mean, that's an estuary, right? I mean, um, how's the climate going to change? Well, okay, the big driver is not that. The big driver is climate change itself, and that's that changing and partitioning between rain and snow. And so what you are seeing is an increased frequency and intensity of large events coming into, this, coming into the delta. That's going to be the big driver. Okay, so the, what we saw as a 10-year event this January is going to shift to like an eight-year event uh, in, its, in its size. That's going to be the bigger impact. That and the fact that your spring flows will get less and less. So I think that's going to have a far greater impact. But it's an interesting, you're thinking of a microclimate impact associated with all of this area of flooding, high evaporation rates, and tropical environments in Stockton. I think actually it'll be the other way around, actually. It'll be driven by the, the Sierra. Now here's somebody who lives in the Delta. I like, or I live in the Delta. I was going to ask if you wanted to buy my house. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think from a political standpoint, trip. there is one thing that protects the Delta, and that's the Delta Protection Commission, which was passed in the legislature back in 1992. Uh, if any of you care, the uh, Delta Protection Commission is currently uh, reshaping their vision, and it seems to be strengthening the fact that they want to limit urbanization. So if you do care, the next meeting is March 2nd. Uh, I know that they'd like a letter, you know, uh, from the people to enable them to make this commission stronger. Also, there's a development in Clarksburg uh, that I am very strongly involved with. And we intend to appeal to the Delta Protection Commission, which will be the first appeal that's ever been made in a primary zone. And if we're victorious, we believe that we can stop urbanization for the next 20 years. Best of luck. Yes. <laughs> Here. A uh, comment and question. Yes. The, the, um, the general characterization of the environmental community is just when it comes to the isolated facilities that don't know what will help. Just to remind people, in 1970, <coughs> actually, the CR Coalition from other environmental organizations actually supported the proposal. That's right. It was tied, though, to a reduction in health exports. And so, given some of the options that you laid out there, where that's conceivable, it's no, no reason why the environmental community couldn't reemerge with uh, that kind of decision. No, in fact, uh, actually, I'm, I'm impressed the environmental community has been actually very flexible about the concept of an, of an isolated facility. There is one political constituency which is absolutely opposed, and those are the people who make a living down in the Delta on the, on the farms, um, because they rightfully worry that once the isolated facility is constructed, the state loses its interest in the levees of the Delta, and they need that state support to keep the levees of the Delta together. So they have good reason to worry about that. So whatever political, uh, and they have said they will not discuss the peripheral canal. It's off the table. Uh, they, won't, they won't talk about it. So until they, until they get around to finding something for them, remember everybody's got their prize, uh, something for them in this process, I think that this is a stalemate. So the question is, really map out the delta, map out the depth of heat, map out, you know, do we really have a good handle on where all the layers are, where all the little dirt, you know, where all the rodent holes are, and, you know, is, is, that, is there some kind of project? Not at UC Davis, but DWR is doing that. DWR, DWR is doing that. So it would be very inappropriate if you, yeah. No, DWR is actively doing that. Just finished a LIDAR survey of the delta, which is going to give you very high resolution topography. Uh, they're updating their subsurface work. Yeah, that's, it's quite a big effort. <coughs> Legislature's throwing lots of money at it. So yeah, there's plenty going on. But will they, now, do you think that independent commission is a way that will actually no. see some bold ideas thoroughly investigated? Until the legislature buys into it, I don't see this happening. Until the legislature says, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll cover our eyes and, and, and vote on what this commission, and vote in favor of what this commission recommends. I don't see it happening. With independent, independent. Right, they have to be able to be independent. But so. ACWA, the ACWA proposals that don't have, have Kind of keep the scientists away from the commission or from the leadership position. That's right. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I think the should be providing the science. It shouldn't be like me shooting his mouth off all the time. Um, it should be. It should, this, it's a political decision. It's not a scientific decision. There's plenty of science there to supply this. It's, this, is, this is a political decision. Early in your talk, you, you mentioned that it was more than just water supply. There yeah. Be system services. So in your opportunistic delta, what are the pluses and minuses in the ecosystem services column? I see the plus being allow, allowing the delta to get salty. Now, that's bad for the farmers, 
uh, on the parts that get salty. Um, and there will be bad years for those farmers when things get salty. But by allowing it to get salty and move, and re basically what you do in the delta is you reestablish a gradient, a salinity, salinity gradient, which was what it was historically. It had a tremendous salinity gradient, and that salinity gradient shifted back and forth on a regular basis and supported these very diverse ecosystems. You look at the, the native species of the delta, they're very well adapted to things getting occasionally salty. The ones that are not well adapted are the invasive species. And so the invasives get knocked back by these changes in salinity. That's at least the working hypothesis. Um, you would be amazed how little we actually understand about, about these systems. So that's why I think in an opportunistic delta, hey, when it's flowing like it was this January, uh, you pump like, you pump like mad. I mean, it's a small proportion that you're taking out of the delta when you do that. So that's, that's why. You had to pick one of the six, which would you pick? Pick what? You had to pick one of the six, which would you pick? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> and none of the above. <laughs> Stacey, let others ask questions here. Okay, so, yeah, okay, so it, it, it really, it kind of depends on which islands fail. Um, it, some of the islands, if they fail and you get this big gulp and you get salt water, salt water in them, it's not going to be such a big deal. But what happens when you get salt into the south delta, into the southern parts of the delta, there isn't a way to flush it out. There isn't, because it's actually kind of a, it's a very high residence time, dead water area, which is where naturally we take water out for, for, for our, at the state water project. And there's no way to route water through that area to flush it all back out. So once you've got salt in the, in the South Delta, you got a lot of salt in the It's very hard to get it out. That's what people worry about most. Northern Delta, you can flush it out using the Sacramento River. But, and the San Joaquin, yeah, you, okay, so things may change in the next few weeks in our understanding of how the San Joaquin will actually be operated. Um, but there's certainly enough that you can put water in from the San Joaquin, but it still won't get the water out of the South Delta, given, given it's based on the modeling that's been done. And I'm going to take one more question, because I think you guys are probably wearing out on all this, and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, but one more question. Stacy. I'll talk to you later. Is anybody, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, have they thought about the problems of mosquitoes and with yeah. all the urbanization, with all yeah. that brackish water okay. and West Nile virus and yeah, other yeah. factors? Great, great question. Okay, so in terms of the ecosystem restoration, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there's a series of showstoppers which are making, we, we can talk about ecosystem restoration until we're blue in the face, but there's really three, and you, the rest of you who are in the business can think of the others, okay? One is mosquitoes. We're all freaked out about West Nile virus. Even though it's not really a major problem, we all perceive it as a major problem. Okay? So West Nile virus. Number two is mercury methylation. And the problem with these settings and in these restored habitats is you tend to get some mercury methylation and some bioaccumulation of mercury. Don't eat the fish, the big fish at least. And the third is dissolved organic carbon. These wetlands produce high volumes of dissolved organic carbon, and people who take the water out of the delta to drink don't want to pay the extra treatment costs associated with dealing with, that, with the DOC. Those are the three showstoppers for ecosystem restoration, suggesting to me again, reminding us all again, that this list of environmental services that we have for the delta are not mutually compatible. Okay? And that's why I think somebody's going to get voted off the island in the long run in this system. Nature will choose who gets voted off the island or politics. I'm betting on nature. Okay, thank you very much.